My name is Brad Skinner. I'm the chairman of Omnitrax. I gave a speech at the Rails Summit in Chicago, Illinois on October 25th. I'd like to share that speech with you because I believe it has ramifications for all of us as citizens and as companies as energy begins to transform this country. So here's the speech that I gave. I've never been a fan of conference speakers because they often give commercials instead of useful information. Today I will stay clear of that tradition and will instead focus on changes occurring in the world around us. Changes which we as individual and as a short line industry can build upon and add to the momentum that is now underway, which can revitalize the United States economy and the employment prospects for all of our citizens. But in order for us to take advantage of the trends now underway, we need to address a very fundamental and unique challenge brought about by a tidal wave of information available to us as citizens of the 21st century, a wave which has the potential to carry us into a rising tide of economic prosperity or which has the potential to overwhelm us, to isolate us from one another, to destroy any possibility of attaining the common good. If you're anywhere near my age, let's, let's call it something over 45, you understand the magnitude of the cultural shift that has taken place on this continent in the last two decades. When I was growing up, people had access to three network television stations, probably less if they lived in a rural area. We communicated via letters or telephones, telephones that were attached to the wall which could only be answered if you were at home. We got our news from newspapers, the radio, or more likely, Walter Cronkite, David Brinkley, or Chet Huntley. The entire country consumed the same news with the same slant every night at 6 o'clock before turning off or tuning in elsewhere. Today, most of us have access to at least 200 television channels where we can pick and choose various interests, reinforce our ideology, and for the most part become disconnected from those around us, hunkering down in the comfort of ideological cocoons or tribes convinced of the rightness of our view and that anyone who has a brain shares our opinion, dismissing, often belittling those whose opinion differ from our own. How ironic it is in this age when we have greater and seamless access to information and communication than at any time in human history. So few of us communicate effectively, rationally, or use research objectively to sort through and assimilate all of the information available to us. With our cell phones and smartphones, iPads, text messaging functions, Facebook accounts, and Yahoo commentary, we talk constantly but add little meaning to the conversation, thinking rarely and listening never. Again, how ironic is it in this age of communications that most of us have forgotten how to communicate, negotiate, or come together for a common good to imagine a better future for the benefit of all of our citizens. Nowhere is this more evident than in our government. Governmentally, we have lost the clear vision of a people dedicated to the principles of the Republic and have often replaced those ideals and purposes with the needs and obligations of a worldwide empire with far-flung vested interests. Our government more and more looks like a dysfunctional company, focused on activity, not results, filling up the day with narrowly defined subjects of little or no strategic value, fighting over scraps instead of creating a broader framework for societal success. Small wonder that most individual businesses and even whole industries behave in a similarly disorganized, dysfunctional, and reactionary manner. Overwhelmed by the machine gun rapid pace of societal and economic change, we have lost our ability and sometimes even our desire to focus on the things that matter, the things that we can in fact change. What I'm now going to focus upon is something of economic value to everyone in this room. So I hope we can think about this subject as a group, learn from it, and in the months and years ahead, do something with it in a spectacular way. Perhaps you remember the book, The Earth is Flat by Thomas Friedman, published in 1994. In that book, Mr. Friedman predicted that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
The result would be 3 billion new customers or 3 billion new competitors. He was probably right on both counts. And the world continues to adjust to those new economic flows and processes. Today, however, we are beginning to see new possibilities in this country and new perspectives that can allow people like us in this room to embrace and to build upon those trends in a positive and creative way that can determine the quality of life for generations to come. In the rail industry, we have seen it all. Truck market share expanding in the 70s, intermodalism expanding in the 80s, railroads of all types, both class ones and short lines becoming profitable and stable throughout the 90s. Those of us sitting in this room have seen all of these things and adjusted to the changes and parameters of the times. Today, we need to do so again. We need to think big. Imagine the possible, seize the opportunities that are staring us in the face and make things happen. The days of entitlements between governments and short lines and class ones are over. Given that fact, what can we do today to make a difference? How can we add value to our company, our industry, our community, and to our nation? We all know what happened throughout the 1990s. Labor and energy costs were high. And many manufacturers had to outsource in order to survive. That paradigm is changing and is about to change even more. Today, in this country, the energy technology revolution is underway and is about to become a game changer for the United States. This energy revolution will change every part of our economy and hopefully the ambition and strategic direction of every company in North America. The concept of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling has been in existence since 1947. But advances since 2009, just the past four years, have made this technology practical from an engineering, economic, and environmental standpoint. Today, it takes an average of 6.7 days to drill a 15,000-foot well. In 2007, the same task took 17.5 days. The lateral length of feet per well has nearly doubled from 2,600 feet to 4,800. Well cost has been reduced by 14% to around 2.5 million per well. The practical effect of this new technology and approach yields 3 to 10 times the production rate of conventional wells and increases drilling intensity per acre. 90% of all the rig fleets are equipped for horizontal drilling. And a typical well today earns back capital within one to two years. There are currently 1,800 rigs in operation today in the United States. These operations on the gas side of energy have produced a 700% increase in natural gas production. And on the oil side, we are experiencing a 21-year high in the production of oil. The International Energy Agency anticipates the U.S. will surpass Saudi Arabia in oil output and Russia in gas output by the year 2020. During the Arab oil embargo of 1973, when Americans sat in lines for hours just to fill up their gas tanks, who among us would have imagined that 40 years later the United States would be on the verge of energy independence? Today, 40 basins of energy exploration in 26 states are being impacted by this revolutionary shift. Crude oil sourcing, home heating product sourcing, feedstocks, and a myriad of propents, piping products, chemicals, water, and cement industries are being affected by this truly explosive growth. Transportation expansion in the forms of transload facilities, rail car productivity, rail car leases, rail freight rates due, rates due to strong demand, truck movements to support drilling sites, and general employment of semi-skilled and non-skilled labor is expanding each day. Sand being handled by railroads, both short lines and class ones, as well as crude by rail, continue to grow. And even though I promise not to commercialize my remarks, I cannot fail to mention that Omnitrax is blessed with about 15% of all the frac sand movements in this country. Energy rail demand is improving. The efficiency of class ones through unit train origins and destinations. 
Abundant supplies of low-cost oil and gas are marking the beginning of a new era of economic vitality, not just in transportation, but in all kinds of basic production industries, the kind of industries that, once upon a time, were the backbone of our economy and a source of national pride. But even as recently as a few years ago, America had given up on those industries. We were told and believed that we couldn't compete in those markets, that our only hope for economic growth or even survival lay in the affirmation technology and service industries. The possibility and reality of America's coming age of energy independence is changing all of that. And it is a phenomenal change for the better. In response to the energy revolution now occurring for the first time in 30 years, steel plants throughout the United States are economically competitive due to low-cost supplies of natural gas and electricity. Lower cost and abundant gas supply is translating into increased supply of lower cost nitrogen-based fertilizers for American farmers. New investments, which will replace 11 million metric tons of imports, are being constructed at nitrogen plants today in Iowa, North Dakota, Indiana, Louisiana, and Missouri. Export markets for surplus natural gas are translating into 20 liquefied natural gas terminals totaling 29 billion cubic foot capacities per day in the design and approval stages. Natural gas is additionally opening all kinds of chemical plant resurgence within the United States in the form of 20 to 30 billion dollars between now and the year 2020. Natural gas will feed these new chemical plants with products that will accelerate and insource back into this country food production, film, bags, diapers, toys, housewares, bottles, PVC, antifreeze, fibers, latex, polystyrene, window frames, medical tubing, insulation, cups, instrument lenses, tires, hose, and medical products, to name but a few. These product manufacturers will come home, and foreign plants will additionally move to the U.S and North America. Regulations on coal are increasing the natural gas potential markets, reversing pipeline flows and the prospects of exporting LNG destined for Europe, reducing European dependence on Russia imports, which again will accelerate U.S. exports. Everyone in this room understands the impact of these advances on the geopolitical scale and while that is important, the opportunities for us who serve the American heartland and the industrial base are also about to have exponential opportunity thrown our way. The combination of U.S. shale and Canadian oil sands is estimated to reduce imports to less than 15% by the year 2020. CAFE standards for automobiles, as technology continues to improve, will drive those imports even lower. At the risk of sounding overly optimistic, I'm enthused about the future of this country. Microsoft and computer expansion saved our future in the 90s. Financial and other short-term thinking helped us keep our heads above water for part of the last decade before ultimately imploding and leaving us standing in the rubble. But I believe energy will reverse so much of the decline of the past 40 years and once again create opportunity for all of our citizens. So what does that mean for us? What role can the short line industry play in reversing these trends? And how do we do that? We should begin by thinking about our own assets and the assets of those property owners and production facilities near our assets or plants that can be moved to our assets. If you believe that this country is about to increase its energy production as much as I do in terms of trends and statistics, then you have to conclude that much of this production and growth will be returned to the sources of that energy, to traditional economic industrial zones where chemicals and plastics and manufacturing and distribution of all types can return. Much of the vacant and unused properties adjoining rail assets should in the years ahead bring about a resurgence and renewal as we witness increased domestic production. 
The first step in getting ready is to understand and assess the potential of our own assets, the properties surrounding those assets, and the capabilities that we can offer as transportation, logistics, and community development experts. Omnitrax is some case studies of how we can work as a part of that process with our brochures and our public documents. Let me use one of those public examples called the Great Western Industrial Park in northern Colorado. The park started with an obsolete factory that was going bankrupt. After taking a long, hard look at that asset, and the management team concluded that with some prudent investments, construction of loop tracks and additional sidings, and with other infrastructure improvement, with private and public monies, the site could become very attractive to domestic and foreign-based customers. Omnitrack's Great Western Industrial Park has become a model of rail resurgence and has demonstrated how a rail-based company joined with real estate experts and oil and gas interests can transform an old factory into a modern production machine containing Vestas with wind turbines, Halliburton, Musket, Owens, Illinois, Front Range Energy, and a variety of sustainable and growing businesses which now employ 2,000 people. Our primary investor, Pat Bro, read the signs, saw the possibilities of what this law, raw land, this asset, could be, sorted through the facts, and backed his vision with hard data, found the right team to implement that vision, and followed through step by step. These customers could have located elsewhere, but the company identified the opportunity for their relocation for markets, for class one connections, and together created real value for the future. I could not have encouraged this type of approach in the 1990s because outsourcing was a common trend. But today, as insourcing becomes a common trend, I believe this type of well thought out assessment of assets, development of strategies, and aggressive marketing directed at not only domestic corporations and ventures, but at foreign transplants is now a probable and viable strategy. The example of the Great Western Industrial Park at Colorado is occurring at many of our other properties, some related to energy, some not. This model could occur all over the country. At a recent Class 1 caucus meeting, I was surprised that some shortline members thought that the class ones owed them something. I think those days are over. What I do believe, however, is that we must become the catalyst for economic revitalization in our communities. The class ones will see the value of our efforts and will work together with us as partners going forward. The short line industry is that part of the rail services of this country that can in fact be creative, is not bound by traditional thinking, is closest to the needs of origin and destination users is closest to the communities that want to relocate industry and good paying jobs and given all of the changes now underway whether your asset is in an energy rich area or in a traditional market everything is about to change all North American assets will experience that change and in the process we can all benefit economically transferring a real and productive legacy to future generations now, I know all of this sounds simple, but we all know it is not. Change requires our full attention, our strategic ideas, our energies, and our commitment to get past the way things have been, to see the way they could be, to create visions and models for the future that anyone in our society can understand and get behind. With or without technology, Human communication and visualizing the art of the possible is essential if we are to succeed with new customers, with financial backers, and with government at all levels. Visualization simply requires that we believe that the things I have talked about today are in fact possible, and that we become committed to the changes and possibilities that can occur with our energy, our commitment, our vision, and our will to succeed. As I conclude my remarks today, 
I want to bring you back to another revolutionary moment in American history, an era that required imagination, vision, and a willingness to take thoughtful risk. The year was 1879, on a day when a young girl named Laura Ingalls Wilder, who would grow up to become an internationally famous writer of children's books, went on a walk with her pa to watch a new railroad being constructed on the barren plains of the Dakota Territory. She wrote later about that experience. Team after team came round the circle. Scraper after scraper tipped over. The teams never stopped coming and the scrapers never stopped filling and tipping. It all goes like clockwork, said Pa. See, no one stands still and no one hurries. The scrapers never have to wait for the plows and the plows just keep going far enough ahead and then they come back again to plow once more. They are doing great work. On the way home, Laura thought, first someone had to think about a railroad. Then the surveyors had come to that empty country and they had marked and measured a railroad that was not there at all. Then the plowman came to, the, to tear up the prairie grass and the scraper men to dig up the dirt. And all of them said they were working on the railroad, but still the railroad wasn't there. Nothing was there yet but cuts through the prairie swells, all pointing westward across the enormous grassy land. There was no railroad there now, but someday the long steel tracks would lie level on the fields, and through the cuts the trains would come roaring and steaming and smoking with speed. The tracks and the trains were not there, but Laura could see them almost as if they were there. Suddenly she asked Paul, was that what made the very first railroad? What are you talking about, Paul asked. Are there railroads because people think of them first when they aren't there? Paul thought for a minute. That's right. Yes, that's what makes things happen. People think of them first. If enough people think of a thing and work hard enough at it, I guess it's pretty nearly bound to happen. Wind and weather permitting. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a crossroads. Our country has a chance to once again be an engine for growth and for renewal. Properties that were abandoned and forlorn years ago and new sites on short lines throughout the country can be the catalyst for our future. Everyone in this room has a chance to be a part of that renewal to imagine a future that does not yet exist, but could exist. If enough of us are willing to latch hold of the vision and work hard to build a new and vibrant future for ourselves and our families and our communities and for our country, if we truly believe it possible and act upon those beliefs, it's pretty nearly bound to happen. Wind and weather permitting. Thank you.